Welcome to the Magellan Podcast, navigating education in the 21st century. This podcast brings the expertise of Magellan Learning Solutions to the biggest questions and issues in higher education. It is produced and directed by Adam Rank, podcast theme written and recorded by Wayne Patton, and it features Magellan partners Wayne Patton, Aaron Traphagen, and Emily Hetty. Cognitive load has been a major topic of conversation among psychologists and educators for the past few decades. Thanks to research in this area, we now have the capacity to design activities and curriculum in a way that helps students to use their mental space effectively for learning new material. But this concept, it goes beyond what's happening in the learning space alone, and it touches all aspects of a student's educational experience. Join the Magellan Partners and guest Dr. Pat Neely, Executive Vice President for Online and Distance Education from Bluefield University, as they discuss cognitive load. Thank you, Adam, and welcome, people, to this third edition of the Magellan Podcast. For today's episode, we have with us Dr. Wayne Patton, CEO here at Magellan, Dr. Emily Hetty, Chief Academic Officer at Magellan, myself, Aaron Trapagan, the Chief Operations Officer here at Magellan, and we're super excited to have Dr. Pat Neely from Bluefield University with us. Uh, welcome, Pat. Oh, thank you so much. I'm glad to be here today. Yeah, and uh, for our listeners out there, uh, would you mind uh, sharing a little bit about yourself so people can get to know you? Sure. I uh, am the Executive Vice President for Online and Distance Learning at Bluefield University. I've been there about five years, but I've spent about 20 years in the uh, working in online and distance learning at a variety of institutions. So um, I'm particularly interested in competency-based education and how that um, uh, curriculum design work and uh, building academic programs. So those are things that make me excited. So thank you. Very good. So glad, Pat, you can join us today to talk about cognitive load. I know we've been having some really fun discussions ahead of time leading up to this. And this is one of those topics that's just it's kind of everywhere. Um, so for all of this, um, I think we, we've all got a lot of experiences to share. And I, I think we also um, probably, though, because of that, want to take just a couple of minutes to really define what cognitive load is um, for purposes of this discussion so that we don't go absolutely everywhere, which we could pretty easily do, I think. So I'll just real quickly say cognitive load is, is essentially the work that your brain's having to do at any one moment to process the stuff that's in it. Um, there are, for, for purposes of discussion, three basic types of cognitive load. And uh, some of these, if you're trying to actually learn something, are good. Some of them are less good. Um, the good kinds are intrinsic load and germane load. Now, intrinsic load is the difficulty that whatever it is you're trying to learn carries with it. So um, something like learning to walk for a baby has very, very heavy intrinsic load. It's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of thinking to learn to walk. Germane load is the work that your brain's doing to process through that information and to store it in your long-term memory, and that's also a good thing. So if we're in an education space, we want to make sure that we're helping students to free up as much of their mental space as possible to work on processing that information. Now, what's not good is extraneous or extrinsic load, pick your term, and that's the extra stuff that your brain's having to do while it's trying to learn, um, and that's really distracting from the task at hand. It's taking away your, your capacity to think about those six or seven things you can handle at any one time. Yeah, probably anything not contributing to the, the learning process itself. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, and those are uh, those are a big deal. I mean, the, the concept of the intrinsic, I mean, I that changes per person too though, right? So, I mean, like you said, if you've got a baby, it might be walking or sometimes an adult, uh, depending on what's going on. But uh, no, I, I know for me, that was like going into a, a physics course, you know, has, you know, a, a high amount of intrinsic load to it. Um, and then all the extraneous load, you know, that goes on, you're starting to get frustrated with things and you've got things going on outside or the teacher's kind of a uh, a little bit rude about <laughs> learning the subject matter, but it might also be that someone is truly an introvert, and when you put them in certain learning situations, they experience more cognitive load than someone who is more comfortable in that type of learning space. Sure. So the thing may get harder depending on the context you're learning it in. Right. Like I'm, I'm not an athlete, but I sort of enjoy certain sports. But I absolutely don't want somebody looking at me while I'm trying to learn. Right. Um, that would make it feel much, much harder. Yeah, we were talking about anxiety earlier and just think about when you're a new student, whether online or residentially, and you're coming in, you know, let's, let's 
you know, look at the canvas, uh, the canvas context of going into a course. It's, it's like being on campus for the first time. Uh, and I was a commuter student and I was sharing the story where my first day of college, I, I drove from my, my parents' home to school. I didn't know where to park. Uh, when I parked my car, I'd shared with Emily that, uh, the, uh, the parking slab had moved revealing the rebar that was underneath that. So I popped my tire and then I later, I got towed actually that day because uh, like, you know, so parking for students is a nightmare anyway. And then that journey to find the class, all these th- 50 things that happened before my first freshman class ever. And then, bam, I'm hit with this moment, this lecture, this introduction to college learning. And I wasn't, I wasn't ready. And I, you know, I don't remember anything that I learned that day in psychology class, but I remember all these other things that I went through in that moment as a brand new student. And there's a million things students go through like that every single day. And this is in the 80s when we didn't have all this technology and all the things we've been discussing. So it's a, it's a, it's a minefield of things students are dealing with now, both traditional students and adult learners. And it just creates a cognitive overload, right, which kind of removes them from the learning situation altogether. Maybe we should have called this cognitive overload. Perhaps. Right? We're all there. Right. Avoiding cognitive. <laughs> yeah, that. Right. Uh, well, so with some of these things, I mean, there are probably some things we can do, you know, with each of these types of load. Are there things we can or are, are some of these unchangeable? Are, are there things we can do to reduce these or, or help get them in the optimal levels? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a kind of inherent difficulty in every task and that we can't really fix. I mean, some things are just they're as hard as they are. Right. Um, however, what we can do is work to decrease distractions um, and things like that. Um, there's there's five effects that research in cognitive load has identified um, fairly recently that I think are helpful as principles. Um, and I'll just run through these really quickly and maybe we can talk about some examples of these as we go. Um, helpful mnemonic, it spells smurge. <laughs> S M R G E. That'll fit right into my vocabulary. That's, that's not a word. Um, okay. So the first of these I think is really common. It's it's the split attention effect, and that's where you're asking students to pay attention to and process more than one thing in order to accomplish a task. Um, real quick example of this, and I'm sure we can think of others. Um, when I was in high school chemistry class, uh, we had we had a lab manual that had a list of all the chemicals and all the paraphernalia we had to use in the labs. And then we'd go do an experiment, um, and I would have to consult the lab manual to find out what the beaker or whatever it was I needed looked like in order to go get it off the shelf in the closet. Would have been a whole lot easier if our instructor had just labeled them in the closet. I wouldn't have had to put together two pieces of information. Now, I think he meant well. I think he thought he was helping us learn more and use our lab manual, but in truth, we were wasting time and mental space. You see that in PowerPoint presentations, too, where you might have the diagram on one slide and the explanation of the diagram is on the next slide or the previous slide. And you see that um, actually in textbooks, too, where the table that they have a table in there in order to make the layout fit, um, the table may not be anywhere near the explanation of what's in the table, right? Okay, another effect is the modality effect. And I'll also introduce the redundancy effect at the same time because these are basically two sides of the same coin. Um, The modality effect says that if you can, as an instructor, present the same information in two different modalities, like visual and oral, um, something like that, even physical, if that's something you could do, touch. Um, If you can present the same information in two modalities, that's helpful to students um, because it reinforces the learning. What is not helpful is if you present the same information in the same modality again. That's the redundancy effect. So two modalities or more, good. Same modality multiple times, bad. Um, A great example of the redundancy effect might be the thing we all just really love, which is when somebody reads their PowerPoint out loud to you. That's fun. Super fun. Y'all don't like that? No. (laughs) Do you, Aaron? Do you like that? Big fan. Big fan. Also known as just tuning them out. Yeah, and, and some people I think get confused because I think they're, you know, they're they're being helpful by putting the information up there. Everybody can see it all, and then they're reading through it, and they're really just kind of reducing the, the students or the learner's ability to intake that information. So Exactly. Words competing with words, with words, with words, too many mm-hmm. words. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Um, another effect is the goal-free effect. Um, now, this, it's, it's easy to misunderstand this one, but what this is saying basically is that beginning learners especially do better when they're led step-by-step through things instead of given a goal and asked to find their own way to achieve it. 
Um, now, this does not mean that as a course instructor, you shouldn't ever tell the students what you're doing or why they're doing something. It doesn't mean that at all. In fact, you want to do that because then they won't know what to do with the knowledge later once they have it. Um, what it does mean is that you don't want to say something like, you know, to a fourth grade math class, um, you need to figure out um, which processes are necessary in order to solve this type of problem in order to achieve this kind of solution without giving them any, any help in getting there. Um, take the level of the learner into account. So it's appropriate to the level of expertise. Okay. Exactly. And that sets up the last effect um, really well, which is the expertise reversal effect. Um, beginning learners, all of this applies really well. Once somebody's fairly expert, like a doctoral student um, who knows a field relatively well, these don't apply nearly as much. In fact, you might get the opposite. Um, if you start trying to go step by step for somebody who's writing their dissertation, for instance, they're probably going to get bored and tune you out. Um, it's actually really good to challenge a learner on that level with with harder work and more work and um, a, a deeper problem. So, again, like Aaron said, keep it keep it at the level of the learner, um, where, the, where the learner needs to be. Yeah, so. and I think that's where you've even mentioned before, I think in the paper, you know, the pulling back in the redundancy effect. So if you're sitting there lecturing through basic steps of something to somebody who's uh, already a practicing expert in a field, they're just kind of shutting down mentally and not paying attention or learning anything new. And just building upon what Aaron just said, so if you go to uh, the Magellan.com website, thinkmagellan.com, the white paper that this podcast is based upon is is found on the website if you want to read that in its entirety. That's correct, Mike. Uh, you can also find it on Facebook. Um, if these are the, the general effects, so how can we apply these, uh, to the learning space? What are some different strategies or, or practices we could use to help negate some of these, uh, elements? I think chunking the, what you're trying to teach the student, what you want them to learn in, in the right chunks. All of us, if you ever taught classes and you have a textbook, you know, in the textbook, chapter one might have not much content. Chapter two might have be loaded with content and chapter three might be light in content. So, so what you have to be careful of, I think, as a faculty member is not designing your course based on we're doing two chapters per week because that is, does not necessarily relate to the cognitive load of the material in those chapters. And so I think it's really important for that, um, for the faculty member to look at this and say, okay, is this really all go together and do we really need to do, maybe we might do one chapter this week and three chapters next week. So I think it's important to think about chunking the material in the right, in the right uh, format for your student based on the level of learner they are. I mean, one of the things for me um, when I was teaching more full-time than I get to teach now is um, just being very self-aware about what feels easy for me and what my preferred modes of learning are and, and not taking for granted the fact that every student is like me. In fact, very few students are like me. Um, I can read a lot really fast. I'm good with words. I'm not a visual person. Um, I would say the majority of my students really benefit from having a graphical way to interface with the material, though. So I had to do the work um, to find a graphic that would actually help get across what I was so very easily able to say in words. Um, that's just it's just the way it is. Um, same thing with the goal-free effect. A lot of times the steps looked really obvious to me to um, say, you know, write a five-page paper on X or Y thing. Well, they're really not obvious to most mm. students, um, and they do need to be taken through step by step. Yeah, and I think that relates to the amount of extraneous load that, that gets put on students. Let's, for me, thinking about the online learning environment, uh, I think as faculty will write an assignment sometimes. I know exactly what I want them to do. I'm fairly certain I have explained that very clearly in, in reasonable steps. Uh, and then I will launch that assignment and I start getting emails from students and messages from students who have no idea what I'm looking for. Well, not no idea, but they're struggling to understand certain specifics or what I'm looking for. Uh, so as an instructor, something I've found helpful is as I'm designing assignments, I will actually try to reset my mind, try to get rid of my pre-existing understanding of the information and walk through the assignment myself, even try to do the assignment uh, and expect, hey, here's a place where somebody who doesn't know what was in my head when I wrote this may not be clear on what's going on. And every one of those little things that you can clear the path for or reduce a bit of extraneous load on those students uh, who are already, you know, at a disadvantage, being distanced and removed from the immediate ability to ask for help. Yeah, good instructional design, and that's something we do here at Magellan Learning Solutions. It, it, it bears that in mind because, again, like 
in my example of of the poor residential student on this journey to the first day of class, uh, online students have the same experience. And, and as we talked about on our previous two podcasts, things like RSI or the, a healthy ecosystem surrounding an online course, there's these millions of steps that students will, you know, journey until they hit that first module. And imagine you've been through all of this, you've looked at online programs, you've applied, you've been accepted, you get all that put together, you go through, you know, talking to your advisor, you finally get in a course, you get in module one, and you're in three or four different courses, and those three or four different courses are all completely different. Mm. And so the instructions aren't written from the same context, and, you know, how you submit those things, there's maybe several different publishers using several different interfaces, And now that's your first moment in an online class. One thing we've talked about a lot with our instructional designers is is just not giving the opportunity for a student to be distracted, even if if you didn't introduce it. Um, An example would be um, putting a link in your online course that asks the student to navigate away from the browser window. Mm. Um, I don't know about all of you, but when I go to a new browser window, there's a whole world of other things I can do in that window. (laughs) often not well connected to the learning I'm trying to do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, even if there's nothing wrong with that other link, um, just embed it in, take the time and embed it in your learning management system. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Something else that really comes to mind, I think it's, it's hard from a residential perspective, but, you know, we're talking about learning and the way we process and and store information from short term to long term memory. Uh, One of those things is, and I don't know the answer on how to fix this, but we students all the time residentially that get to slate their own schedules. And you'll see a Tuesday, Thursday schedule packed from morning till afternoon so they can slam all those courses into those two days and have five days off. Um, But that does not give them the time to stop and categorize that information, put it into a schema, store it in long-term information. So by the time they move from this course, which they never stopped and summarized that information or tried to get it into long-term memory. They've moved to the next course. They're, they're on to the next topic. They've forgotten most of the key elements from there. And so, you know, I don't know the answer here, but um, I, I'm longing for a day when we can solve that where the residential schedule can be set up in such a way to... Honestly, it happens online too, though, yeah. right? I mean, you've got a lot of kind of weekend warriors doing online learning yep. who... Yep basically have to slam their knowledge on Saturday night or Sunday night. And um, it's, it's just not conducive. No, I think there's, there are some solutions for residential. You might look at a block schedule where students are, are not concentrated on five classes. Instead, they may only be needing to doing a week, eight week term with two to three courses at a time. Um, And with online students, I think you, if you can just give them some strategies to try to help get organized One of the things I also think that's really helpful for online students is uh, taking time to allow students to reflect on the material and to connect it to the other things that they've learned in their program or in the course. And you might do that with uh, a muddiest point type discussion, which is where the students are able to talk about what they've learned. And um, also there's confidence surveys. I don't don't know if you've ever used those with um, your students, but if you you're teaching them some concepts that are particularly difficult, you might actually just do a little brief survey with them and say, okay, what? here are the five things in this, rate your level of confidence mm-hmm. that you understand these five concepts and how to apply them. And I, I think we don't ask students enough what, where the gaps are, what what's really causing you difficulty mastering these concepts. And then especially if they can go through an exercise and see how accurate their estimation was, right? right? right. That helps create some self-awareness yeah. too. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, I think the review is, is a big deal. I mean, trying to create some space uh, in a, a module or unit or week, however you break it up, where folks can recap what they previously learned. Totally agree with that. And, you know, I, I think a great exercise I see all the time, too, is just ending a lesson or a period of instruction with, you know, summarizing and recapping what we've learned. And, you know, I think in your in the paper, you know, there was uh, some mention of sort of high, the ability to highlight, mm-hmm. you know, key elements that are important. It just takes me back to grade school with the the faculty member, you know, the the instructor stomping their foot mm-hmm. like this. Yeah, this will be seen again soon, right? right. Um, and and it's really that so just helping people focus on these the topics are important. 
um, and helping them store that in their memory. I had, um, this was an undergrad way back when I was in a film theory class. Um, and it was just, I realized as, you know, a much, much more advanced professional now than I was at age 21, irritated at having to do all this work. Um, I had just some brilliant learning design from that instructor. It was, you know, it's film theory, right? So it's hard, hard, hard reading. I mean, big vocabulary words, highly specialized, but, uh, and we had to do one per class and it was a three day a week class, one article per class. And for each of those, we had to take a little index card and write a summary of the article and then flip it over. We had to write um, a couple of key questions we had based on this. Then we had to trade cards with somebody else in our row and we had to answer their questions and bring it back to the next class. It's so smart, right? Summarizing is a great cognitive activity because it forces you to pull out the important points. Um, It forced us to take these 30-page articles and not regurgitate, but cut it down to the size of an index card. Um, Then we had to ask some good questions. Then we had to answer somebody else's questions. And often people's questions were not right. So then you could have to do the work of reframing the question. Well, and that's why, I mean, I think you pointed out again in the white paper, but why handwriting is, you know, proven to to help with uh, handwriting notes has been proven to help, you know, with memory of the information, recall um, you're forced to sort of summarize as you're listening instead of sort of mindlessly typing verbatim uh, as the lecture is going on. So, yeah. Any other thoughts on uh, good strategies? I think the only one that I maybe we did here and maybe my ears went off, but uh, just examples, um, you know, creating examples. And I think I see this a lot uh, in online design. I, I think it probably happens a lot in residential traditional classrooms as well but we give an assignment especially these complex projects Mm -hmm. and you really feel like I've laid this out but there's still a lot of interpretation to be done by the students on the other end of that and they are trying to figure out what you need and and I think a lot of faculty that I have tried to work with from an instructional design perspective have been worried about examples because they're worried students are just going to copy what they give Um, but a, a well done example can really go a long way to help a student relate, okay, this is what they mean by this concept when they're looking for, you know, this kind of idea or approach. That's really good. Pat, you mentioned one thing when we were talking Uh ahead of time, um, which was the eliminating the nice to know information. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah. If you could just eliminate the nice to know information, because that just creates additional cognitive load that they don't need. Really, if you just provide the specifics of what they need to do. I mean, yes, it's nice to read four optional articles on a topic of your choice. And it's nice of you to include that in your course, but the probability is the students aren't going to read those articles. And do you really want them to read those articles as part of that course? Maybe you want them to have those for a future time when they want to learn more about some topic, but you really want them focused and spending their energy on what you're trying to achieve and the outcomes you're trying to to, uh, reach in the course rather than giving them lots of Lots of extra things. So maybe some sort of end of course email or something like that. Just saying, hey, if you've really enjoyed this, here's some things you that's, could look at down well, the Well, that's a great suggestion. Yeah, I think I, I really like that because why muddy the water during each of your units or each of week with this extra stuff? It would be far better, I think, at the end. And I love the examples part. I, I, I try to do that in classes I've taught over the years because, and I don't provide a perfect example. I don't provide mm-hmm. a, 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 a plus paper as the example because really what you want the student to do is to just get an idea of how to get started. Often they're just staring at a blank piece of paper and they're trying to figure out, okay, how do I even format it? How do I even structure it? And so... So I've given out papers that are B papers and said, now this is not a perfect paper there, but at least it gives you an idea of the types of things that I'm looking for in this assignment. So. Maybe chunks of the paper, you yes, know, little right. examples you could extract to show this yeah. theory here, this concept there. Right. No, that's that's a great dot. Explicitly on the concept of germane load and just thinking about that creating schemas and structure and trying to connect stuff. Um, I feel like that is that is a place a lot of people want to talk to people about cognitive load. They get a little lost in the germane load piece. And so really thinking about that explicitly, you know, what are some of the things that can be done there to help people make those connections? And I think the most obvious thing that most places do when we design a program is prerequisites, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's step one towards helping interconnect those, you know, different structures of thought. So what are some other explicit thoughts on just helping create or connect varying schemas or or, uh, structures like that. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. Um, If you have guiding institutional documents like, um, you know, program outcomes or core competencies, just taking a moment to remind students of why they're learning something and how it fits in the whole of what they're doing is really important for that. 
Um, I think there's also some, you know, relatively simple things we can do within each course. Um, one would be just making some space and some time for repetition. Right. Um, you can't really learn a lot of things without doing it over and over and over again. Right. And concept mapping helps a lot too. So if you want to talk about, okay, here's, you know, you could just draw a map of here's the overall outcomes that we want and here's how these things connect. I mean, I think it's, it's almost like mind mapping, only it's concept mapping. So Yeah, I love that. Especially think if a lot of times faculty aren't always, you're writing course one and this person's writing course two and this person's writing course three. They're often not in the same room together writing those so that they perfectly line up. But if you know the prerequisite knowledge somebody's supposed to have, making sure maybe you spend a little bit of time ensuring we're kind of connecting, reaffirming those elements and and tying back to them as you move into that new material. Yeah, and, and asking students to do some of these things too, like switch the modality of the information right. they're learning. Mm-hmm. Um, I used to do an activity that I sort of stumbled on. Um, I'm going to go Brit lit for a minute, so sorry. Um, Wordsworth's poem, Lines Written Above Tintern Abbey. Yeah, Aaron's about to. I was late it. for my little uh, slide rule thing. but <laughs> yeah, <I'm> Too late. <laughs> so it's this poem about, well, Wordsworth himself sitting there looking at Tintern Abbey at the ruins of it. Um, and the thing is he can't actually see them. Um, so I would always just make students close read the poem and draw what they were seeing. And it's it's really about the fact that there's a lot of vagrants in the area. There are people kind of camping out, building fires and whatever. The Abbey's not there. It's only in the title of the poem. They don't know that it's not there until I make them draw it. <laughs> um, so that's a great close reading activity. And then we can have the conversation about why it's not there. Um, so much better than if I said, the Abbey's not there. Let's talk about it. <laughs> so they switch the modality. They learn more. Good idea. All right. Any other thoughts there? I don't know. I right. mean, there's a lot of thoughts there. Oh, there's so, a lot. I mean, we could talk all day on this one. But we just, we'll... I'm just pondering poetry now. Sorry. <laughs> would you like a reading, Wayne? I can, yes. I can do a reading. That would be no. good. Wayne, did you have more talking you wanted to do? No. 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 <laughs> all right. So moving on besides the material in a course, and, and that's a lot of what we've talked about, where are some other places that cognitive load shows up for students in their experience uh, that can interfere with that learning process. I can tell you one symptom that you can see when they are in cognitive overload is they disappear. Mm-hmm. When you have students who all of a sudden have been coming to class and all of a sudden they are no longer engaged, then I and in online you see that by then they're no longer posting to the discussions or whatever. I think that certainly is a behavior that gives you a clue that that student may be experiencing cognitive overload, even f- either they're. Um, having a difficult time with the material or the format, or perhaps they have a life events going on. But but that certainly is a clue for the faculty member that the student is possibly in cognitive overload. So. Yeah, it's kind of a fight or flight right. incarnation of that, right? Right. And and as we look at the the larger picture of the entire you know student experience, uh, I think Emily outlined a few key areas too where we'll see uh, cognitive load introduced. Um, socioeconomic status uh, is one of those areas, um, strongly held beliefs, emotional state, desire and motivation, pre-existing learning habits, uh, and then, of course, the unexpected life happens factor, as you called it. Um, so so kind of going to the top of this list, thinking about socioeconomic status, I mean, how does that create load for a student or for a learner? Um, I mean, one example I can think of is a student who might struggle to purchase the textbooks for the the course early on and they're maybe trying to work it through using open access resources they're borrowing from a friend they have an old edition something like that so they're just they're having to go through a lot of time and effort to get what's maybe not exactly the best resource right i think there's just a whole um a slew for the lack of a better word of problems that socioeconomic status can cause for students students from low e- income status one is they're not always familiar with the language of college, not just the language of your course, but the language of college. What's a semester? Or a, you know, what are credits? Um, why are we doing this schedule that's Monday, Wednesday, Friday? Um, so they're just a lot of things that are unfamiliar for them. And so what might seem very simple to us as a faculty member who's worked in higher ed for a really long time, and we think we're being clear as can be, to someone who's never seen that language before, it, it is a true cognitive load for them to try to master that as well as a new environment and a, and being with new people that they don't know. So I, I think we all need to be cognizant of that. 
Yeah, I think some of the bigger players in the online space, they'll they'll have kind of an at-risk student dashboard that clarifies all different types of things about students. And one of them is, is this a first-time generational college student? Because the data suggests that they're going to have a, a, a different journey than those that are maybe fifth-generation um, you know, student. Uh, yeah, we have a system at Bluefield where we kind of give some risk factors to assign risk factors to students, and um, that's helpful. Um, what I don't think we've done enough of at Bluefield or in general is study who are those students who have socioeconomic backgrounds and they're successful in spite of it. And so what are those skills and how do we design courses that help those people to be successful? What can they tell us about design course, successful course design, whether it's a seated course or an online course? No, that's a great point. Because we were talking earlier about, you know, the, the concept of grit, mm-hmm. right? And, and and that tenacity to kind of stick it out uh, regardless of maybe the skill set you came into college with. And I think there are, you know, faculty and, and leaders in higher ed space that that I think when I went to school in the 80s, it was kind of a, you'll make it if you make it, really. I mean, I think I had a lot of faculty that cared about me, but at the end of the, you know, at the end of the day, it was on the student to make it. And if you didn't, it was really we didn't do anything wrong. It was the student had a life situation or there was too much on their plate or they weren't ready for this or whatever. But I think we've that, that's an encouraging thing about, you know, where higher ed is now and, and all the how we use data and analytics to kind of look at all these different pieces and to be, you know, cognizant of the fact that we, we have learners coming to us from across the spectrum and our philosophy in the College for General Studies where we all work together was, okay, they're on our watch now. We've got to understand who is coming to us, how equipped are they, how do we supplement that, how can we reduce things like cognitive load, how can we, um, you know, um, grease the rails, as it were, to help them in, in any way that we can. And it's really a, it's a teaching and, and it's a student-centered philosophy. And and some institutions are more advanced in, in how they view sure. that or – or, or, or pursue that, I would say, wouldn't you? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, go ahead, sir. Oh, no, I was just going to say, and sometimes it, it, the school's intention to try to help with some of these issues gets misconstrued, too, uh, in the political environment, which maybe falls a little under the strongly held belief side next time. But, you know, if a student is hungry, uh, that can place a large amount of load on their ability to focus on learning and, and whatnot. And so you see schools all over the place, whether it's trying to create food pantries or, or food programs so that, you know, uh, low socioeconomic students can come in and have food and they can, you know, not be hungry while sitting there trying to learn or, you know, have the health products or, you know, things they need on that front. My personally, as the, the child of a low income single, um, you know, mom, you know, she was trying to do school with a baby, um, you know, and so that that's a big deal. That's she's trying to make her way, you know, forward in life through school. But, I, you know, I created, um, <laughs> you know, a certain amount of of uh, extraneous load on my mom that, you know, what can you do? And, and there are some thoughts and sometimes schools try to do things in this vein and, you know, it gets kind of draped over into the political realm of things but i think people just i think sometimes that's a lack of understanding of of these concepts and philosophies right that's a great point one of the things we can do too it's not every time but often the lower your socioeconomic status is the harder it is for you to absorb something different in your life right Mm -hmm. a financial emergency obviously or, or even a schedule change um i worked recently on a residential campus that was just super social super social um on the whole not low income um but If, for example, um, the nursing program decided to schedule some extra study sessions, if they only did those for maybe one hour on a Wednesday night, the students who had jobs couldn't get to those. And chances are if they had a job, it was because they needed a job. Nobody's doing it for fun. Um, So, you know, doing the sorts of things we can not to spring things on people, not to say, oh, by the way, you all need to wear such and such color to whatever event that we have scheduled or um, you all need to watch X program on Hulu tonight or on Amazon Prime. This person that's out in your online class may not have access to those. So just thinking of these things and being very, very transparent ahead of time about what's going to be required and when it's going to be required. Well, I mean, then go into things like parking fees and, yeah. and ticketing mm-hmm. on campuses, right? Um, there's going to be some students that park wherever they want, and that $50 ticket isn't going to change their life. But right. 
that $50 ticket could send somebody else's life into a tailspin, and suddenly they have to determine do they need to drop out because they need that money back. And put a registration hold on their account yeah. because they parked illegally. Yeah. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So that's a big one. And so moving over to strongly held beliefs and, and these, you know, don't all have to be, as we've alluded to, political, though in today's day and age, that can be a, a difficulty as a faculty member or, or, you know, in teaching students. I think we've had this conversation a lot in the car on rides to places, but sometimes you can just say something and an entire school of philosophy is ascribed to you. And a learner can just shut down in their learning mode. I um, I taught, uh, we have some core classes that all, stu- all of our traditional students take. And most of the time I work with online students. So they were desperate. So they asked me to teach uh, one of our core classes. And so. Only when they're desperate. Uh, only when they're desperate. Right? <laughs> So they're like, oh, gosh, she's a lot of body. Maybe she is. You know, so. <laughs> but anyway, I, I love doing it because I get to connect with students. So I love it because I, um, you know, most of the time I'm connecting through technology, either through the phone or whatever. So to actually sit in the room with students, I love it. But but it was so interesting to me because I had students in there who were from the inner city in Richmond and in uh, and from Tidewater area, and then I had students from rural Southwest Virginia, um, and they had very different prejudices and beliefs. And so, for a faculty member, that can create um, some cognitive load and stress for the faculty member as they try to navigate how do you how do you have real conversations about important things without making everybody angry and upset. So, so yeah, so that's um, certainly a challenge faculty face. And that can even happen in an online discussion board. If, if you're not monitoring your discussion board closely as a faculty member, things can get out of hand there. So quickly, quickly. No, but that's a, that's a good, <laughs> a good point is that it isn't always students, you know, yeah. with the cognitive load. I mean, it really is, you know, faculty, it's, it's everybody. Um, I think one of the most common ones I've had is uh, students come into a course with a preconception of how they learn, um, regardless uh, of what we know about how people learn. Sorry, I'm a kinesthetic learner. So, you know, immediately there's this obstacle to being able to to get them to process information and and, and learn in the course because they have already determined I can only learn this way. Or I am not a math person. Right. right. Oh, yeah. There is nothing you can do to help me learn math. Never heard that. I've never heard that. <laughs> well, but on the faculty side, are we then sometimes resistant to to hear that and say, okay, well, how can I help them understand that you don't have to be a math person, you know, to, to get this and to take away the principles and the values, right? Right. Well, and I think we we can, when people say that, I think there's ways that you can short step them into being okay. So you give them some low stake stuff, you give them some formative assessment type stuff. And so you give them some things where they can be successful early on. And then that helps, I think, to diminish cognitive load when they see that they can actually have a chance to be successful in that math class that they put off till their final senior semester, right? Absolutely. I did that. (laughs) No, I'm sure you did. Well, a good, a good, you know, uh, initial course or an FYE type course can help students with this too, because, you know, in courses that we've designed in the past, you know, in that that front, that you know, new online student course, that FYE course kind of area, um, you can really help students understand things like just the concept of what is liberal arts education, getting rid of that idea about you're not, you know, that's not a political term right? Or explaining to them how to communicate with faculty, you know, at the school based on the approach and policy. Um, And all of that can reduce the stress as they move through the program. And just to your, you know, your note, Pat, we've had students senior year, they've put that course off and somehow in their senior year, they take and they're like, wow, I feel like school would have been so much easier if I'd taken this when I was supposed to have. (laughs) Yeah. I think too, in classes, you can do some I'll call them wellness activities for lack of a better term, where you can just have some little low stakes, fun, funny um, activities. Um, maybe you give them a few minutes. If you're doing face to face, maybe you give them two, a few minutes just to focus on some topic or to, to just kind of chill out a little bit. Um, and then online, you can do some fun things too. But I, if you can lighten that first initial few minutes you have with the student, it certainly makes it much easier for them then to be ready to learn. 
Yeah, so that just helps uh, set their emotional state, right, which is one of those key areas we've talked about. So also we talked about desire and motivation, you know, and in, in cognitive load. So where, where does that play a factor? Yeah, I think um, helping students to be mindful about what they hope to get out of the class, why they're there, why they're getting the degree um, can, can go a long way. Um, I, I did an accreditation visit at a, a school and this was, it was a super basic activity, but um, they had incoming students right on this plexiglass wall with, um, you know, expo marker or whatever. I'm here because, and then they filled in the blanks. And it was, you know, everything from I want a better life for my children to um, my grandmother died of a heart attack, so I want to be a nurse so I can help people like that. Um, they just asked them to articulate that. And then they did it again their second year, and they did it again their third year. And um, the motivations often changed. Um, and that was a really cool learning experience um, for everyone to be able to do that. And I think those those centering moments um, can really help, um, especially when you're teaching the subject that the student doesn't really want to be learning at the moment. Um, you know, m- maybe they don't want to be in Spanish class. I think a lot of people probably don't want to be in Spanish class. I love Spanish class, but a lot of people don't want to be there. Um, maybe you're just there because that's standing between you and a degree. And I think as a faculty member, you can say, okay. Um, But I hope that you'll learn some things that will help you travel one day um, that will maybe help you when you watch Sesame Street with your children, you know, things like that. Um, If if you can just get the students to articulate the why, um, that can reduce the load. You did that in the Aaron, Aaron Traphagen uh, created a a course and a uh, was a co-author of a text that dealt with new online students. And that was one of your exercises, I believe, is why are you here? What are your goals? And, you know, it's, it becomes this fixed point of reference, right? The cognitive load and the journey itself that you experience, it's, it's painful. But if you have that fixed point of reference and you know why you're there and you know what your goals are, some of those pains, though still yeah. painful, kind of fall by the wayside as you persist through to that target. Yeah, so everybody there has an, un, you know, whether it's a perceived or unperceived need, they're there for. And sometimes helping students understand that unperceived need and really helping them dig into it is is a big deal uh you know you may be there because you want to be in you know one job and you know meanwhile i have to take biology and and math and i don't understand what this has to do with what i want to do with my life and you know helping students understand that and i think in a place that you know especially i think the liberal arts the gen ed is an area that's a sticking point for a lot of students get that frustration um, you know, and, and explaining that to students in a way that helps them understand the values of what that is going to help them do with their future goals and what their plans are. Uh, suddenly you get that aha moment. And they're like, okay, I get it. And at least enough to say, I'll participate and reduce that load a little bit. And I mean, one thing that we all deal with is competing motivations and competing desires. I'm, you know, like I want to get my degree and I want to be successful, but I also want to um, make a lot of money. But wait, I'm an English major. Um, But I also (laughs) want to just go to the beach this weekend. Um, But oh, wait, I'll fail. So trying to really take some time with students and whether that's you as a faculty member or whether it's an advisor or, you know, maybe it's an administrator who's got a student in trouble in your office. Um, Just taking some time and working through those things and saying, you know, you're going to have to say no to some things. Um, to say yes to other things. And you need to figure out what kind of life you want to build for yourself. Years ago, I worked for uh, Western Governors University, and I started out as a mentor in the college business. And so um, so I had 80 students assigned to me to mentor, right? And so um, one of the conversations I had at the very beginning with students was, um, how are you going to fit this program that you're doing into your already busy life. And so we would actually talk about, okay, are you a morning person? Can you get up at five instead of six so that you have an extra hour to study? Um, Can you take your books with you when you take your kids to tennis practice? Uh, Are you an evening person who studies? Or are you a person who has support? Will your mom keep your kids for you on Saturday so that you can do your schoolwork? Or will you know, will your husband take care of the kids on Sunday afternoon? So trying to help um, students work through that because that's all, all they need is one of those things to blow up and their cognitive load is gone. They do not have the capacity at that point to learn. So, yeah, do yeah. they have a system in place to share some of that load, right? right. Yeah. And, yes. and what system do we have in place to help people realize that, right? And so right. that's that's yes. great that that school does. A lot of schools don't, right? right? Hey, you want six classes? That's great. You know, here's six classes. But it's becoming less rare, but it has been rare 
at the enrollment or where you're signing up for your classes, somebody stopped me and saying, hey, stop for a second. Yes. Let's talk Can about you this. handle this? And that's always encouraging to see more and more schools going that way. Okay. Yeah, I think that's another thing you did in, in your course and in your text. You had people assess their support network. Right. Mm-hmm. That's because we were awesome. But um, <laughs> no. Um, so uh, a lot of these things, I mean, some of them you can't do everything about everything, right? So, uh, but there are even more these unexpected life happens kind of things. And I think those have fallen in that realm. Um, but are there other life happens type factors, the things you can't necessarily expect? You know, what do those look like and what, what can we do, if anything, uh, to, to help students adjust with those and reduce the load? I think clear expectations helps a lot. So if you have a clear expectations about what late work looks like, about if you need, if, you know, your, your tire blows out on the way to school or your husband gets laid off and you need a week to um, get yourself back together. Um, if, if the faculty member or the institution is very clear up front what, what that looks like. I think that relieves a lot of stress for the students and a lot of cognitive load because then they're not fretting about and worried about what are they going to do because they are not going to get their assignment done on Wednesday night, right, or Sunday night or whenever it's. Yeah, and just seeming like somebody who's approachable. Um, I think, you know, you start doing that work, you know, even maybe before the semester starts. Um, you shouldn't have a student who maybe their tire does blow on the way to work and they're afraid to contact you because they're worried you might be mad. Right. Um, the student should see you as someone who's partnering with them in getting the learning to happen that needs to happen. Um, so, yeah, just being kind mm-hmm. yeah. is, is huge. And as an institution, maybe empowering faculty to be that way too, right? Yes, because, I mean, exactly. in this age of kind of industrialized, in some cases, online education, uh, some faculty may not feel they're empowered to, to afford that kind of grace and atmosphere. And so as an administration enabling our faculty to have that grace and understanding and work with those students, I think is a big deal. All right. No debates there. Um, <laughs> we agree. Aaron. Oh, yes. All right. So besides all of that and trying to help st- students manage their own attention, what are some of the practical things universities can do then to reduce cognitive load? So here's a fun example. This is from my, my previous campus, and we did fix this, so it was okay um, after the fact. But um, we had a we had a room on campus called the Blackwell Ballroom, which if you – are familiar with the campus, you know where it is. It's, you know, a kind of central location. The thing was, it's not on any of the campus maps. Oh, gosh. Because it's inside a building. So the building is on the map, but the ballroom is not. Mm -hmm. So we would have, you know, people coming for orientation. We would have parents trying to navigate campus, and we would have major events happening in a place that wasn't on the map. So that's a kind of silly example. We Like I said, we did fix it. But Thinking about what your campus, whether it's an online campus or a residential campus, looks like to somebody who's not familiar with it um, is a really, really important exercise to go through. And that that means things need to be called by the same name all the time. Um, I know lots of campuses have nicknames for everything. Um, Making sure that the nickname doesn't become the official name. Right. um, Or that there's maybe some way to kind of get that crosswalk. Um, Keeping your maps clean. Um, you know, things like that. Just just make sure that an outsider knows how to get around. I would offer, too, that improving communication or and being very clear about how you're going to communicate with students helps to reduce cognitive load. So if you're going to email them, you're clear up front. You're going to get email from me. You need to look for email from me. I'm not going to be texting you. I'm not going to be doing these other things to be really clear about. Um, and, and as much as possible... Uh, we faculty in higher ed like to be wordy sometimes. We want to tell you. Um, I've certainly learned put the most important thing in the in the first sentence or two. Uh, bullet points are lovely if you can do that so that students do not have to hunt for. That works with faculty, too. So they don't have to. They're busy. <laughs> faculty are busy. So they don't have to hunt for what you're really trying to say to them. So if we can, you can find a way to reduce the noise for students, I think that's really helpful. Sure. What about on a a student services kind of perspective? Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, you've got options where you can run to 15 different offices on, you know, on campus trying to meet all of your obligations. Or, you know, a lot of schools have gone more to these central kind of service areas where students can go one place, maybe even have one representative uh, that can help them get all of those essential elements done. But when you're worried about whether or not financial aid is going to hit or I'm going to get dropped before the first week of class. And, you know, I can't even get my books yet because that's not approved. And, you know, that makes it very difficult to focus on, 
you know, what you need to do there on Canvas. Sure. And if you're on the phone with a student, you know, and it's it's online, right, the warm transfer matters a whole mm-hmm. lot more mm-hmm. um, than you think it would. But just taking a minute and saying, you know, hey, hey, Jenny, I've got so and so on the phone. Here's their problem goes so far um, with helping the student feel cared for and, and um, peaceful. And having sometimes a one-stop, if your institution has a one-stop place for student questions where they can know they can go there to at least get started to get an answer instead of saying, oh, gosh, do I go to the registrar's office? Do I go to the bursar's office? Where, you know, do the financial aid office? Where do I go? So if you have a one-stop for them, that makes a tremendous difference, I think. So. And we've got a great example of that here locally. We've got a school with, with some folks we talk to all the time, and um, they've adopted a concierge model where essentially, you know, if a student calls in with an issue, you tag your it, but you are the person you are going to help them solve that problem. And your job is to let them off the phone and tell them, don't worry about it. We're going to get scored away. The buck what, stops at whomever takes that. Yeah. Yeah. That this person doesn't have to worry about being transferred 15 places. They know that I've spoken to somebody. It is going to be taken care of and they will get back to me to help resolve this. And that that alleviates a lot of, you know, that load and pressure. Yeah, we're back to the, you know, the previous podcast. It's about the ecosystem, right? You have now planted this student into what kind of um, experience? And it's a, it's a lot of moving parts there. I think you definitely alluded to, uh, to the cognitive load thing when we're talking about ecosystem because they tie in so, so neatly. Scheduling, I think, is another big thing. I mean, I talked about it earlier, but to me, it's, it's one of those massive pieces. I mean, we know that people don't retain information that way. And so trying to take steps to help students. And I know, you know, a lot of schools have at least, you know, publishing a course sequence, helping students understand the order which would be best to take these courses in, trying as best you can, you know, to offer courses at the times that, you know, students need them. They're not sitting there in the middle of a semester trying to get through stuff. Meanwhile, they don't have a core course they need to graduate. Um, And, of course, recognizing everybody doesn't have unlimited resources. So, you know, just taking the time, I think, as an institution to think about where the places we are distracting students from learning, you know, with these administrative processes or scheduling or whatnot. It'd be great if we apply what we know about good teaching in the classroom to the way the whole campus runs, wouldn't it? Eh, wouldn't it? No. <laughs> <laughs> now, I was just thinking, you know, how many schools um, run an orientation experience, whether it's an online, a hybrid, or in person, where, you know, every support office on campus gets their 20 minutes to explain what they do? And, right. you know, at the end of that, you've got 36 hours of little video modules to watch or something like that. I mean, I can't learn anything that way. Um, Yet somehow that's how things keep happening. Um, Getting information to students when they need it in a timely fashion. Like don't teach them to register before they've attended their first class. Teach them to register the week before registration opens. Mm -hmm. Does anyone happen to know the the figure of the percentage of students that start college that eventually graduate with either an associate's or bachelor's? Less than 50%. Yeah. Exactly. So it, it makes you wonder if you could look at that data and say what were the, you know, the causes for that um, lack of matriculation. Mm-hmm. What is the role of cognitive load, especially now that there are these 8 million things that, that are happening around us digitally and socially and culturally that are going on? It would be an interesting study to, to really – you know, narrow that down and say, wow, of those 50%, how much of of the pace of life and all the interference and, and lack of reflection time and lack of, um, what did we call it? Uh, we, we didn't even have the phrase 20 years ago, um, getting away from it all. Disconnecting. Uh, disconnecting, yeah. We didn't even have to disconnect uh, 20 years ago. But it'd be interesting because uh, it's tougher than ever for students. Granted, they've kind of grown up in this digital world but uh, I suspect it's a pretty high percentage of folks that don't don't finish something they start because of because of this very issue. Yeah, and I think it's it's key to think that, you know, it's it's been you know 50 minutes or so since we said this is what cognitive load is and kind of introduced those three areas of load. But all of this bad stuff is really all that extraneous load. So all of these things are the things that are keeping people have nothing to do with the intrinsic nature of the subject matter, um, and they have nothing to do, you know, with helping a student create those schemas and and store that information. It's all extraneous load that is distracting students from learning, right? And so this is a big topic, and we could go on forever um, in all these little details. So 
we, we get this great understanding of cognitive load. So thinking bigger picture, how can our understanding of cognitive load help us to be smarter about how we approach things in general? Like what other areas is this relevant? Um, one thing we were talking about as we were prepping was just what life felt like during the pandemic. Um, and I mean, I was one of those, um, I had a full-time job. Um, my workplace went remote, so I was working from home. And, you know, at first I thought, this is great. You know, I don't have to commute an hour every day. I'm working from home. But my kids, who are elementary school age, were also working from home. Um, so I was getting pinged for attention just every couple of minutes. And, um, of course, I, I went to college, you know, 25 years ago when we didn't have cell phones that, you know, were wired to us every minute of the day. Um, if I went into a lecture, I expected to sit there for two hours and simply listen and take notes. So I know how to make blocks of time. I, I know the power of that. Um, my kids do not. Um, they have never learned in an uninterrupted environment. Um, and I think we've got to, as, as people working at universities, be very mindful of the fact that students, the fact that students don't know how to do this is not, it's, it's something that's real. Right. And we need to be very mindful and very deliberate about teaching, for example, the power of turning off your wireless. Right. Um, if you need to read a 30 page article, you know, go somewhere without the Internet and leave your phone. Nobody's going to die if you don't have your phone with you um, and just do it. Where were you last week while I was trying to read your white paper? Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Aaron, turn off your wireless. Turn off your wireless, Aaron. Got it. No, those are great thoughts. Any other uh, general thoughts on? We'd also talked about just training. Um, you know, student orientations are a way of training, making students aware that, yes, you, you've lived in this digital world since your birth, but here's the impact on your learning and take them through some of these examples. And, you know, we do a lot of faculty and staff training as well, um, making them aware of these kind of student situations to, to, to kind of craft a, a, again, a student centered focus on, on, um, on their policies and procedures, bearing all of this in mind. Right. Yes. I don't think faculty are really trained on cognitive load, no. many of them. Uh, and so for them, I mean, I think once you explain it to them, it probably makes total sense to them. But but they're not thinking about that when they're designing their course. Or maybe they're teaching a course they've had for a long time and and, and they don't realize the differences that technology have made in terms of of causing the lack of attention, the inattention to the to the content. Or, or even that administration level. I mean, I think, you know, from an administrative perspective, how many, you know, executives at the schools are thinking about this, you know, when they're sitting down uh, with their department heads and, and they're crafting these larger policies um, and how disconnected those policies are. And, and they don't think about how they all build together to create an even larger, you know, set of load on the students. Yeah. I mean, one thing I had to learn um, when I was in grad school and I was a GA for English classes was, um, Fraternity life at Indiana U was just massive. And um, during rush week, um, students were not going to be engaged. So just, again, trying to take time to kind of be mindful about these things. And on the administration level, I would have loved it if the administration had just sent out an email like, by the way, instructors, it's rush week for the fraternities. Um, be aware that you may have some students who are not at full capacity. Um, not to take away academic freedom, not to say you have to. Um, you know, let them sleep through class or something like that. Um, I did let a student sleep through class because he wasn't allowed to sleep as part of the rush process. And um, and in my mind, I figured I was going to save his academic career if I just let him sleep for an hour. Um, it's probably more than I could have done, but um, I tried. Yeah, absolutely. There, there's a lot of big picture things. And I think to me, the the biggest thing folks can do is sit down with people at their institution and talk about these things and, and take a look, self-reflect, you know, just like we ask students to do, you know, in their life as they're doing their schedule, what can I change? You know, if I can't change it, you know, at my level, who can I bring into the conversation to talk about how we can change it? Because I just don't believe there's a lot of people at these institutions that don't care about the student and, and where they're trying to go. So I think if you just start the conversation, you, you're going to find answers and, and people eager to be part of the solution. Well, and I think faculty, we don't talk to them enough about this because they probably know in their courses where students have big hiccups, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe they need additional training on how you can offer alternative methods of, of, of studying that material. I mean, if you look at your test scores, you know what the students are having problems with. And so, so but 
Has anybody said to them, oh, well, this might be a cognitive load issue and you could actually chunk this a little differently or you could add some formative assessments in there so that students could take a little quiz on this part so that they they have the opportunity not to have it all in um, a high stakes assessment. So, um, and maybe somebody who's at a chair or a dean level, right. um, you know, if the faculty member could just kind of say, my students are having trouble here. Do you have any ideas? It's, it right. maybe isn't faculty training. It may be that the prerequisite course has changed structure and you don't know it. Right. And there's no communication going on. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. No, I, I think that's a that's a big deal. I mean, I think if there was more communication between people in, say, a, a prerequisite structure yeah. uh, about what's going on, hey, I'm making this tweak, hey, are we still talking about the same, you know, vocabulary and same frameworks, um, that could help students a lot. All right. Well, uh, as we get ready to kind of wrap things up, um, killing it on time yet again. Um, <laughs> I'd love to give everybody a chance if they've got any final thoughts, just, you know, any last thoughts, um, and Pat, will give you the, uh, the pleasure of going first or last. You, you know, I'll, I'll go first. Um, I, I'll be fine. Way to put our guest on the spot. Mm-hmm. Just but I was trying to give her all the choice. We haven't talked about to um, uh, load and it's, and there's a design theory out there called universal design for learning. Are you guys familiar with mm-hmm. that? And so um, that also can be a way to try to help with cognitive load because then you design multiple forms of learning, m- multiple avenues for students to master the material. And then that allows students to find the fit that works best for them. And so in one course you might have, um, maybe you have a, do a quiz or a project or or some formative assessment, some other things that allows them to find the way that helps them master the material. Also, I'm not a big proponent proponent of courses where there's just like high stakes assessments. There's only a midterm and a final. Um, I would say that that's really makes tr- creates tremendous cognitive load for students. Right? Um, if there's a way for you to have multiple assessments, multiple assessment types then that certainly would make things better for students. So, but thank you for inviting me today to talk about this. I love this. Uh, I love curriculum planning, so this is great for me. Um, Pat, one thing we talked about um, right before this started was that technology is kind of our greatest friend and our, our greatest enemy um, when in trying to manage cognitive right. load, um, trying to manage all kinds of things. Um, besides the fact that students learning in the online environment are, they're online, right? They're they're on technology all the time. You can't tell them, close the technology and do your learning. It's not right. possible. <laughs> no. um, but we can be really mindful about the ways we're using technology. I mean, I think there's there's any number of well-meaning instructors out there who jump on every new technological bandwagon that comes along because it looks it looks fun, something mm-hmm. like that. Um, one example that we were talking about was Prezi, which um, thank you for remembering the name yes. of that, that yeah. thing. Um, it's a PowerPoint alternative. It's cloud-based, um, and it takes all of the kind of graphical animation stuff out of PowerPoint, and it's sort of, I think you said it, Aaron, it becomes the thing, right? <laughs> it becomes the main thing. Um, I remember our um, Center for Teaching and Learning um, back in the day was, you know, all excited about Prezi, right. and I was sitting in this training session on Prezi thinking, I'm going to have a migraine. Right. Um, and I'm fairly neurotypical. Um, I don't deal with distraction issues or things like that. I cannot imagine how difficult an interface like that would be for somebody who really struggles to process a lot of sensory inputs. Um, so just really kind of thinking through those things and making friends with, you mentioned universal design, right? Your, your friends in the accessibility resources right. office or disability services, um, talking to your folks in the Center for Teaching Excellence or whatever you have um, and saying, I'm thinking about using this because I think it's fun. Is this a stupid idea? That's a good place to go. It is to them. Yes. Uh, I would say in closing, just, you know, think about the faculty that kind of helped get me through uh, my undergrad experience. It was about communication. So no one's going to know that there's a cognitive load issue or life situation or a logistical issue from a student perspective, unless there are open lines of communication. And I think that part of my experience was it was a handful of people that, they ask about me. How are you doing? They could read to Pat's point earlier. They could kind of see what was going on in young Wayne Patton and they were compassionate and through their communication and compassion, I could see a way forward past my current, you know, stressors or whatever I was going through academically um, and how life was impacting that. It was about community and communication and compassion. And I think that's, that's something we, 
we grappled with uh, in our in our pregame of this was what does that look like in the online environment? And I still think we're all trying to figure out how to best do that. But we've uh, we've got to figure that out. Yeah, good points. I think it, it, as I think about cognitive load and all of this discussion, I think about faculty who worry about academic rigor. Um, and a lot of times when we talk about, you know, doing certain things to assist students, it can sound like a reduction of academic rigor. And, and, and I'd just like to say, I don't think there's anything related to cognitive load that would require people to make their course less rigorous. In fact, I would almost think if you really think through applying these principles when you design a curriculum, you could actually make a course more rigorous because a student would have more of their their working memory to focus on the learning uh, and on that germane load element. Um, so that's just my final thought. I think if we do these things and, and you're a faculty member who's concerned about rigor, um, then then this is something that's going to help you maintain that rigor or, or create the rigor in your course that you're looking for because you're going to be able to help students focus on learning, not where to find the syllabus or where to submit their assignment. Um, so that, that's my big takeaway from this. So we appreciate everybody listening. Pat, we appreciate you being here with us. Uh, we, we love you and, and love working with you and, and love having you here. So thank you so much. And uh, we look forward to talking to everybody next time. Take care. Thank you for listening to our discussion on cognitive load. If you enjoyed the podcast today or found it helpful, follow us on iTunes, Spotify, or where you listen to podcasts and listen to our earlier episodes on regular and substantive interaction and online learning ecosystems. Leave a review. Let us know what you think. And if you're looking for our next episode, we have one coming soon. If you or your school is looking for help with your online ecosystems, RSI, consulting, or course development, our team would love to help. Reach out to us at thinkmagellan.com. Thank you for joining us on the Magellan Podcast, navigating education in the 21st century.